Okay, so here's lesson four in our unit on motion and mechanics. And we're dealing with projectile motion today. Now, presumably, projectile motion is something that you've seen um, or had a little bit of exposure to in a previous course in physics, um, perhaps an introductory course in physics. Um, and certainly, um, you would have encountered this in, the, in a grade 11 course, uh, you know, if you're taking the Ontario curriculum. And um, so today, really, what we're interested in we're, is we're interested in, in revisiting what projectile motion is all about and then solving a couple of problems and maybe even using some i-hat and j-hat notation um, to solve some of these problems. So projectile motion is, of course, one example of motion in two dimensions. So it's an object that's going to move through both the X and Y dimension at the same time. Um, it, it is simply one example of two-dimensional motion. Of course, relative velocity and relative motion is another example of two-dimensional motion. Um, but in projectiles, you know, using projectiles, we have to remember that a projectile is an object that moves under the influence of gravity only. Um, in our simplified version of physics, projectile motion, we do not uh, really incorporate air resistance into our problem solving yet. Of course you will if you continue to study physics in later years. But what that means is, is that projectile motion for our purposes is the combination of two different types of motion. Constant velocity in the x direction and then free fall motion in the vertical direction. And we've looked at both of these in some of our analyses of one-dimensional motion. So when we solve problems, you know, we're going to definitely want to draw a diagram and obey the sign conventions associated with the Cartesian coordinate system, right? So it's very hap very helpful that, you know, we, we really do have to pay very close attention to these sign conventions that we set up at the beginning. Which way is positive? Um, and very often you'll see a problem-solving strategy is to place put the origin of your coordinate system where the motion begins. Now, you, you certainly don't have to do this, but this is very often something that can help you to solve problems in projectile motion. Initial velocities, of course, are going to be given, but initial velocities in this case won't just be in X or Y. They'll be in both X and Y. Um, and so we're starting with initial velocities in both directions. Now, to kind of remember what projectile motion is all about, um, we can take a look at um, a little applet, which is a projectile motion applet found on um, found at fet.colorado.edu. And these are all basically physics, science, math simulations. And here we've got um, a little cannon. And using this cannon, we're going to launch one of our choices of projectiles, and it can be anything that we want, pumpkin looks the most interesting here. Um, these FET sims are really, really great. We're going to use them throughout the course. But um, we're going to load a pumpkin into this cannon. We can set our initial angle to be whatever we want. And perhaps um, we can set the initial angle to be uh, 60 degrees, which is quite the incline. And what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and match our angle and our initial velocity, um, or rather our initial speed, and we're going to try and get it to land right here. So here, um, you know, 10 is fine. Let's, let's do something more interesting. Let's say 16. So we got an angle of 60 degrees. We got an initial speed of 16. Of course, the mass of this pumpkin is going to be 5 kilograms. So when we're ready, and we can zoom out a little bit just so we can see the whole projectile. Um, when we're ready, what we can say is we can fire. And so we've overshot our target. So a couple of things could change. You know, we could adjust the angle of our cannon and we can fire it again and see if by decreasing 10 degrees up here will help. And of course, it actually didn't help. And one of the reasons we know that is because as we approach 45 degrees, we come to the maximum range of any projectile. And we know that we get maximum range when we hit 45 degrees, and that was something that we studied heavily last year. So, of course, what we need to do is we need to back off in this range. So that was the wrong direction to go. We can say, okay, well, if 60 degrees isn't right, then we could say, okay, well, let's try 75 degrees. 
and this projectile is going to go far too high and it's going to land a little bit short. So we know that if our original shot was between 60, was 60 and it was too much, and this shot was 75 and it was too little, then we can adjust and we can say, okay, well, how about 70? And that did it. And it got us almost right in the bullseye. And so basically we use some range finding to hit our target. Now we can also do the same thing if we say, okay, well, let's go to 45. Let's go, let's set maximum range in the angle. But let's say our initial speed, let's adjust this. Let's say, let's, let's choose six kilometers or sorry, meters per second. And of course that was far too short. We really didn't get enough velocity to even make it out of the cannon. So let's try something much larger. Let's try 60 meters per second. And that, as you can see, if I zoom out, that is far, far, far too much. I overshot the target by a huge amount. So 60 meters per second is no good. So let's go to something intermediate and we'll say 12. So if I fire here, Oh, and 12 is just good. We can see that it, we just barely made it um, onto the target. And so these are the, some of the kinds of things that you can do with this applet. Um, one of the other interesting things is that we can also choose to add some air resistance. So here's a pumpkin. Um, and, and let's see what this projectile... Now, we, we realize that, okay, with a 45-degree angle and 12 meters per second, we'd hit that target perfectly if we didn't have air resistance. Okay, well now we do have air resistance, so let's see what we get. And of course now we are a little bit shy of the target because air resistance is of course going to prevent us from where to go. So there's a whole bunch of things that you can play with um, if you'd like to launch a human, which I'm sure some people are very interested in doing. You can do that and there's a whole bunch of things that you can fire out of this cannon. Um... There's even the option that you can fire a car. Anyhow, um, something very interesting for you to play with. And of course, we come back and we're ready now. Now that we've kind of reviewed what projectile motion is, we can take a look at some problems. So here is a very, very typical example. A golf ball is launched from a rooftop with a velocity of 20 meters per second. We're going to launch it at 30 degrees above the horizontal and... We're up on top of this roof. We're 45 meters above the ground. So we want to find two things. We want to find how long this projectile's in the air before it hits the ground. And we want to find the range, so the horizontal displacement. Very, very standard and typical question. Okay, so here's our little diagram. And we're going to set zero, our zero mark, both in horizontal and in vertical, where the ball is. So it's right here um, at this location. And this is going to be our origin. Which means that the ground then, if up is positive, because that's what Cartesian coordinate system tells us, up is positive, and this direction is the positive in, in the x, um, then really the ground is at minus 45 degrees. And so if we know that, one of the first things we have to do is we have to say, okay, well, what do we know in this problem? Because, you know, a very typical way of solving these is to use either, you know, the guess method, G-U-E-S-S, -S, or, or the grasp method, you know, what's given, what's required, um, what's our approach, uh, what's the solution, and, and um, um, basically going through these steps is what's going to aid us. So here, we know that V1 is 20 meters per second. We know it's launched at 30 degrees above the horizontal. So what we need to do is we need to look at, okay, what's the X component of velocity and what's the Y component of velocity? And certainly we can do this with a little bit of trigonometry we can basically say, all right, V1, then, if I use my trig ratios, is 20 cos 30, and that's in the x direction, so that's i hat, plus 20 sine 30, which is the y direction, so that's in the j hat. We know that by the time this ball comes crashing to the ground, it will have been displaced a distance of negative 45 meters, right? So d2 minus d1 in the y direction is negative 45. We also know that the acceleration in the y direction is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So those are in the j hat direction. 
We don't know much about the x direction though. We don't know, we, we know it's initial velocity um, and we know it's going to be constant velocity in the x direction. But here we have dx and we don't know what that is. That's one of the things that we're being asked to find. That's a required element and we also don't know the time of flight. So that is a required element as well. So when it comes to looking at one of our big five equations, and for us this is equation number three, that displacement's equal to v1t plus one-half at squared. We know at this point, okay, so we're going to have to separate our components. We're going to have to look at the i-hats, and we're going to have to look at the j-hats. And so what we do is, when, when we actually put this into um, our equation, we've got x i-hat minus 45 j-hat. That's our displacement vector. That's where the ball ends up. The ball ends up at a coordinate of x meters away from zero, and minus 45 meters below zero um, in x and y. Here, right here, is v1. And that's simply this expression, and I've substituted in some of my numbers here, times time, and I've got minus 4.9 j hat t squared. So now it comes time to say, okay, well, what do we do with this? Because I can't combine i hats and j hats. They're in different directions. So I need to make a decision. And one of those decisions is, that I say, okay, here's my system for i-hats, and I can solve that. And so I basically have minus 45, excuse me, I said i-hat, I meant j-hat. This is more at minus 45 j-hat equals 10 j-hat t minus 4.9 j-hat t squared. And because we're all in the j-hat direction, I've simply um, done away with that notation. And here, in the x-direction, I have 17.3 t. So we know that acceleration is zero in the x direction. This is what I'm left over with. Again, I've replaced all the i hats. I don't need them anymore. We know that's the whole reason that we do it. We know that, okay, this is going to be um, how we get at this solution using um, basically our horizontal and our vertical. So if we come back over here, we know that time can flip back and forth, right? Time can go back and forth between i hat and j hat. And here we have a quadratic equation. Of course, we need to solve the quadratic equation. Um, and so we say that time is equal to 10 plus or minus 10 squared plus 4.9 times 4 times 45 all divided by 9.8. If you need a refresher on the quadratic equation, this is just b. Um, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared plus 4ac all divided by 2a. Okay, so that's all I've done here, but quadratic equation should be easy for you folks. And of course, the solution to this is 4.22 seconds. There will be another root, and of course, that other root is negative, and it's inadmissible. We don't use it in this case because time as a negative number has no meaning. We then say, well, there's the time of flight. So I've actually answered the first part of this question. And I can use this answer to find out how far it's gone in x. Because this is how long it's taken to fall to the ground. When the displacement is 0, this is how long it's taken. Excuse me, when the displacement's minus 45, which we set right here, this is how long it's taken to fall to the ground. Well, coincidentally, how long it takes to fall to the ground is also how long it takes to reach its maximum range, and we can multiply this out and we get 73 meters. So to conclude this, um, we basically can say that um, the ball is in the air for 4.22 seconds and it travels 73 meters. Another example, which is very, very standard, um, and I get this example from um, the textbook that I used in university, uh, Physics for Scientists and Engineers uh, by Surway and Beichner. Um, this is uh, a great example of basically a, a rescue plane dropping a package of emergency rations to uh, party below. Okay, and so if the train is traveling, excuse me, if the plane is traveling horizontally at 40 meters per second and is 100 meters above the ground, where does the package strike to ground relative to where it was released? So Again, we should probably draw a diagram in this case. And so here's an airplane, and it's traveling at 40 meters per second. 
and it's 100 meters above the ground, as was stated. Well, when that package is dropped by this plane, it has an X velocity. The package was on board the plane, and so the package is also traveling at 40 meters per second. So because of this, to someone on the ground, this is a projectile. Because, yes, it's just been dropped from the plane, but that initial X velocity gives it this parabolic motion. And so what we can say then is that, okay, well, V1 is 40 meters per second, but it's in the I-hat direction. Because the plane is traveling horizontally, so is the package. We know that the acceleration is in the J-hat direction, and is specifically the value of G, which is minus 9.8 meters per second squared. Our displacement is what we want to know. It's x i hat minus 100 j hat. Because when the package hits the ground, it will have traveled a distance of negative 100 meters. Um, coincidentally, at the same time, it will also hit x. So again, we turn to displacement is equal to v1 t plus 1 half a t squared. And we're going to separate out our components. So first, we can write x i hat minus 100 j hat. That's our displacement vector. And that's equal to 40 i hat t minus 4.9 j hat t squared. And this is the point where we come to where we say, OK, well, really, we can't do anything more with this because I've got i hats and I've got j hats, so I need to separate them out. And that's exactly what I do. We'll look first in, in the j hat direction because this problem is complete. This part is complete, and we can solve it. So we got minus 100 j hat equals minus 4.9 j hat t squared. And if I divide 100 by 4.9 and then take the square root of it, I get a time of 4.5 seconds. Okay. And coincidentally, again, I can use this time now in my equation uh, in the horizontal direction, and I can say, okay, well, x i hat is equal to 40 i hat t. Pop this time in, and I get about 180 meters. Okay, And so... Um, we now have basically solved the problem that was given, but I'm going to leave you with two other problems to try on your own. First question, um, find the velocity of the package as it hits the ground. So what speed does it have as it hits the ground? You can check your answer against this, um, which would be 40 i hat minus 44.3 j hat meters per second. And where is the plane when the package hits the ground? So what are its coordinates when the package hits the ground, and of course you can compare your answer to this answer, which is 181 i hat plus 100 j hat meters, which is basically right above where the package lands, 100 meters above where the package lands. So that's all for projectile motion. Um, usually in class we will spend um, uh, several days working on these concepts. Um, so good luck, and uh, we'll see you next time.